conference is Hendrik Zeus, um, who will speak about beta invariance on T varieties. Yes, so many thanks for the invitation. And yeah, happy to, to take part in this conference here. And really what I'm presenting are essentially old results, but in a, in a new packaging, which became available now, as we have now the, the evaluative criteria for, for case stability. And let me first recall somehow the, the classical definition of K poly stability on the left hand side here. So where we consider um, test configurations, so families over A1 coming with the C star action. And somehow we associate uh, an invariant to such a degeneration called the Futaki invariant. And really this can be seen as uh, this invariant coming from a functional on the special fiber. So which I call the Futaki character uh, and denoted in this way. So, and the Futaki character eats uh, C star action. So one parameter a subgroup of, uh, uh, of the maximal torus acting on the special fiber and yeah, gives us a number. And we want this number to be generally positive, except if the degeneration we started with was actually trivial. So uh, a, a product, I mean. And then we have a new form or newer formulation of or test for K poly stability, and this uses the beta invariants, which to my knowledge are, were introduced by Fujita. And um, what do, are we going to do here? So we consider prime divisors over our variety X, and then we have an invariant associated to this divisor called the beta invariant. And here we want this beta invariant to be generally positive, except for the situation where E is what I call a horizontal divisor. And I'm going to explain this in more detail a little bit later, but the rough idea is that those horizontal divisors should correspond to this product test configurations on the left-hand side. And we can uh, weaken this uh, not notion a little bit. We can say that now our variety is not K polystable, but just divisorial polystable. If the same holds just for prime divisors on X itself. Okay, and this is going to play a role a little bit later. Okay, and this is also a notion due to uh, Fujita. Okay, and so one point I guess here to make is that um, both sides have their advantages. So some things are easier to see on one side, other things are easier to see on the other side, and we will make use of both sides in this talk. Okay. Let me uh, start with the Futaki character, so which played a role on the left-hand side of the picture. And here the point is uh, that it is really a character. So meaning if I consider two commuting C star actions on my variety, um, then I can also consider the, the, the product of them. And I'm writing this product here additively because uh, yeah, and this gives rise to the um, abelian group of one parameter subgroups. So I really want to write this additively. And the point here is that, um, yeah, it's a character. So it's a linear form on the one parameter subgroups. In other words, this becomes the Futeke character of the first one plus the Futeke character of the second one which is going to be useful later on. And um, yeah, so the Futaki character is invariant under uh, conjugation by 
um, automorphisms, which is cl clear, but um, will also play a role a little bit later. Okay. Now we move on to the right-hand side of the picture on the previous board. So we are talking about beta invariance, and here I just recall the definition. So we plug in some divisor, um, prime divisor over x, and so I can talk about its uh, log discrepancy, and this is the first number which goes here into the definition, and then we have a second part which is here described in terms of an integral and uh, certain intersection numbers. And what's relatively easy to see uh, from this description is if I pick um, two divisors E and E prime on X, so not over X, but on the variety itself. And let's say E prime is linearly equivalent to E plus some um, effective divisor D, then it's straightforward to see from this definition that then the beta invariant of E prime is um, yeah, bounded from below by the beta invariant of E. So and if we are if we have to check positivity, then uh, so we can forget about E prime and um, reduce or just check E, the positivity of E here. Okay, this is also going to play a part or a role later on. Okay, and now let's have a concrete or have a look at a concrete example. So it's a completely simple one. So I'm just looking at the uh, quadric threefold. So given by this equation here, so uh, five variables, x squared plus yz minus uv in P4. And the first thing to observe is that um, we have a two torus acting here and it's generated by two one parameter subgroups. And how do they act? Um, so the first one, which I call lambda one, acts by weight zero, one, minus one, zero, zero on the variables x, y, z, u, and v. And the second one acts by weights zero, 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 one, and minus one. Okay, and um, the first thing we learn here by about the Futeki character on Q is that it has to be zero just by applying what we just learned on the previous board. Why is this the case? I mean, we have, we see here a lot of symmetry um, around. For example, we see that we can swap Y and Z and this swapping the, the coordinates Y and Z keeps the quadric of course invariant and it turns the C star action lambda one into minus lambda one. So it, in, as you can see, it um, inverts the weights, right? One becomes minus one and vice versa. So what we see is that the Futaki character of, if we apply it to lambda one is the same as the Futaki character of Q applied to minus lambda one, because I claimed it's invariant under uh, automorphisms. But on the other hand, because I also claimed that the Futeki character is linear, this means this thing here has to be zero. And similarly for uh, lambda two, right? So I have the same argument for lambda two because now I can swap the variables U and V and the same argument tells me that the Futaki character has to vanish on my second one parameter subgroup. But since those two one parameter subgroups generate uh, the maximal torus, it actually tells us that the Futaki character vanishes on all one parameter subgroups. So it has to be zero. Okay, so this will be a useful fact later on. And 
Now we consider a special type of varieties. So T varieties of complexity one, which were mentioned uh, before. And so what does this mean? So I have an effective action of a torus on X. So I'm, I always assume that this action is effective. And the dimension of T is exactly one less than the dimension of X. Okay, and now assume that um, the Futaki character is uh, vanished, so it, it, it's zero. Then what we have is that X is K polystable. If and only if it is uh, what I called divisorial poly, divisorially polystable. So in other words, uh, it's sufficient to check prime divisors on, uh, on X um, or the, the positivity of the beta invariant for prime divisors on X to deduce K poly stability. Okay, and how is this useful? So I'm going back to my example of the um, quadric threefold. I mean, first we observe that the quadric threefold indeed fulfills the uh, assumptions of this theorem, right? So um, we had a two torus acting on it, and we just concluded that the Futaki character vanishes. Okay, so let's apply it to our situation. So um, yeah, of course, if, if I'm considering here Fano varieties, I always assume everything with respect to the anti-canonical polarization. So um, the line bundle here to consider is. Uh, for the, for the quadric is O of uh, three. And by the observation, which I uh, mentioned uh, when I considered the beta invariant, right? So if I'm now considering only divisors on the quadric threefold, then um, everything, every divisor can be written as, uh, or as linearly equivalent to the hyperplane section plus some effective remaining part. So actually it's sufficient here to check the positivity of um, just the beta invariant of the hyperplane section. And this is a one line or in this case, two line uh, calculation. So everything is super explicit and you calculate uh, the beta invariant here is one over eight, so it's positive. So we just concluded that the quadric threefold is K poly stable, which is of course known for a long time and not really uh, a new result, but uh, I hope it's um, convincing that we, we were able to do this in a, in a one line calculation. Okay, um, now let's maybe turn to, to the proof of um, the, the theorem, which I just presented, so this one, that once the Futeki character is zero, it's sufficient to check divisorial polystability. Okay. Um, and before doing this, maybe let me uh, remind you how the connection of the both sides on my first board actually works. And actually, we have seen this at least. Yeah, I think a few times uh, in this uh, conference already. So what's the idea? How are beta invariants connected to test configurations? So the idea is that we, uh, if we have a prime divisor over our variety X, then this induces first uh, filtration on, let's say here, uh, multiples of our uh, line bundle. So let's say K times L. And what we are doing is we just take the global sections of uh, our line bundle 
which sufficiently vanish on our divisor. And this is the second parameter R here. Ah, uh, sorry. Oh, let me, yeah, I could write it like this. Let me write it differently. So I'm looking for, for the sections um, which have the property that the vanishing along E is at least R. Okay, and now I can uh, construct my family, so my test configuration by uh, via the Reese construction from this filtration. So this will be the approach. Now I have here two sums, one over K and one over R. And um, I taking here the corresponding part of the filtration. Okay, and the, the approach here is um, corresponding to the K grading on, uh, so the grading here, uh, the, the first grading by K is used for the approach construction and the second grading here induces a C star action or GM action on the whole family. And I call this lambda. Okay, and I can also look at the uh, special fiber of this family, which I denote uh, also by XE, but not curly, but straight uh, XE. So this is just the uh, special fiber of this family. And this also comes with an action of lambda, just restricted to the special fiber. And yeah, you, you can also directly obtain this uh, by taking the proj of the associated graded object for this filtration. Okay, so what do we know in this situation? I mean, the first or well, most important point here is that now the Futaki invariant of this um, test configuration, or in other words, the Futaki character of the special fiber applied to the C star action, which comes with this test configuration is just exactly the beta invariant of the devi prime divisor we started with, right? Our prime divisor E, which goes into the uh, construction at the beginning. Okay, and now we have to understand one when do we get the, the product test configuration? So when is the special fiber actually um, isomorphic to the variety we started with? And it turns out this is exactly the case if the if we take the valuation corresponding to our prime divisor, and if we restrict this to the field of invariant functions invariant under our C star action. And, right, so I, I mean, if, the, if we have a C star action on the special fiber, but the special fiber is actually um, isomorphic to our original variety X, then when I have a C star action on the special fiber, I also have a C star action on X. So this notation here makes sense. And, um, I want this to be the trivial valuation. So this restriction is assumed to be trivial. And another way to char characterize this is that our lambda uh, now acts, so we just observed if we have this isomorphism, then uh, lambda acts on X and also eventually on the, on the divisor over X. And here horizontally means it acts 
trivially on this divisor. Okay, and I want to give this a name. I call such a divisor horizontal. Okay, so this hopefully explains the, the, the term from the first board. So I'm, in some sense, I'm particularly interested also in these horizontal divisors and every, um, yeah, let me just say this. So they play a special role. And you can also see that um, now the beta invariant of a horizontal divisor in this sense, right, is just since we X is now isomorphic to isomorphic to the special fiber of our test configuration. And the Futaki character of the special fiber is also the Futaki character of X. And we see that the beta invariant of such a horizontal divisor is just the Futaki character of X applied to the uh, one parameter subgroup, which vanishes or which acts trivially on our horizontal divisor. Okay. Let's move on. Um, so we now uh, dive a little bit into the, the theory of uh, T varieties, but only a bit really. So we have our uh, action of a torus on X and we denote the character lattice of our torus by M. And what we have to do here is we have to fix a certain section from the character lattice into, um, into the group of semi-invariant functions or homogeneous functions on our variety X. So, so those are semi-invariant. So for this reason, uh, I have the brackets around T. So I'm not looking at invariant functions, but semi-invariant ones. So they are homogeneous with respect to some degree or some weight. And I, I have to fix a group homomorphism, which sends a character to some function, which is um, semi-invariant semi uh, of this weight. Okay, and there's a choice involved, but I make this choice once and for all. And now I want to understand um, um, somehow in, in the end valuations on, uh, on X, which are invariant under T, but yeah, actually, so up to this point, I only uh, considered um, valuations coming from divisors. So let me stick with this. So if I start with an invariant uh, divisor, torus invariant divisor on my ver variety or over my variety, then this gives rise to a T invariant valuation and now I can associate to this T invariant valuation a valuation on the um, uh, field of invariant functions. So I can take my valuation and I restrict it to now the field of invariant functions. And this gives me a valuation there and I'm going to, to denote this by mu. Okay, so, but it depends on our choice of E. Okay, and then I can associate a second object to, to my valuation. So I can associate some functional W, which takes 
await so an element from my character lattice. Oh, sorry. So let's say it goes from M to um, yeah, Z. So it takes an element from my character lattice. And then we had seen that oh, we came up with a section from the character lattice to the semi-invariant functions. So I can associate to you my semi-invariant function psi u, and then I simply apply my evaluation coming from my divisor e. And it's not hard to see that this is necessarily a linear map. So in other words, we can see um, w as an element of the co-corrector lattice. So of the dual lattice corresponding to M. Okay, and yeah, these two um, objects which I associate to, to uh, valuation on X will play a particular role in what's coming next. So I feel that I forgot to tell you something, but yeah, we will see. Okay, so um, yeah, so just a reminder. So we started with the torus invariant divisor and we associated two objects to it. So one was an element or evaluation on the field of invariant functions. And the second thing was a co-corrector. OK, so now um, the first observation here is what happens if I pick two torus invariant divisors on X or over X, so E and E prime, and they give rise to, or they risk the, the, if I take the value, corresponding valuations and I restrict them to the field of invariant functions, then what I get uh, are proportional valuations. So by this, I mean, they just, differ by a positive multiple. Right, so there, there's some uh, positive, um, uh, one is a positive multiple of the other one. Okay, so what, what happens in this case? So it turns out that then actually the special fibers of the corresponding test configurations are isomorphic. So that's the first observation here. So um, I get they actually give rise to the same uh, yeah, special fiber of the test configuration, but they might give rise to different um, one parameter or different C star actions on the special fiber. So the next thing we want to take care of is actually what happens to, um, to the um, yeah, how do the, the two C star actions on the special fiber relate to each other? And eventually, um, how are the corresponding Futaki invariants related to each other? Okay, so, um, so what I forgot here is so we actually have, um, if, if the two restricted 
um, valuations are proportional to each other, then um, the special fibers are isomorphic, but also um, the two one parameter subgroups here differ only by these double, the corresponding W. So we have the one parameter subgroup act, acting on the special fiber corresponding to E and the one corresponding to E prime. And the question is how are they related to each other? And it turns out lambda minus W is then proportional to lambda prime minus W prime. And what I'm writing here makes indeed sense. So we can see this as a, a lambda was a one parameter subgroup of the maximal torus of the special fiber, but um, also uh, W can be understood as a one parameter subgroup um, of the maximal torus of the special fiber. So it doesn't make sense to consider the difference and um, these two differences are actually proportional. Okay. And what we immediately get from this is, if you recall how the beta invariant was um, related to the Futaki character on the special fiber, right? So it just told us that um, we have to take the beta invariant, uh, sorry, the Futaki invariant of lambda or the Futaki, the Futaki character of lambda prime respectively. And now if we apply the Futaki character to these differences, then we see what we obtain is the beta invariant of E minus the Futaki character applied to W is proportional to the beta invariant applied to E prime minus the Futaki character uh, of W prime. And the point here is that if I know that, or if I assume that the Futaki character is zero, right? And this was one of our assumptions at the beginning from the main theorem, then those two beta invariants will actually be proportional to each, to each other. So in particular, if one is uh, positive, then the other one will be positive as well. Okay, and that's essentially the main idea which uh, goes in to the proof and but we have to restrict ourselves now to the case of complexity one t varieties so uh, again we have a torus acting on x and uh, but now the dimension of the torus is one less than the dimension of x and um, the the special feature of this situation is that now the field of invariance is a field of dimension one. So it's automatically the, the function field of a smooth curve. And actually, if we assume that X was Fano, then this smooth curve has to be P1. So since I'm, for the moment, at least I'm only interested in the, in the Fano case. So actually the field of invariance um, of X is just the, the function field of P1. And another way to say this, uh, that we have this inclusion of the function field of P1 inside the function field of X, just a reformulation of this or a geometric reformulation of this is just that we have a rational map which can be thought as a quotient map from x down to our quotient curve which i told you just in our setting will be always p1 okay and now if we consider uh, 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 prime divisor E prime on X itself, then <clears throat> we can look at the vanishing order, so the, the corresponding valuation, and restrict it to the field 
function field of the curve. So recall this was just the field on, of invariant functions on X. And um, so this gives me some valuation on the function field of P1 here. So this is really P1. And, but the, the valuations on P1 are very well understood. So there, there is not much uh, going on. Actually, every such valuation is just proportional to the vanishing order of a point on P1, right? So there's a certain point, small y in P1, such that my, my restricted valuation is proportional to the vanishing order of that point. And how does this relate to our quotient map here and to, 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 to the geometric, ge sorry, geometric picture here? It just means if, if uh, we are in such a setting, then um, the image of our divisor E prime under the quotient map will be exactly this point, right? This point Y on P1. Uh, which gave rise to, to the vanishing order, which was proportional to the restriction of the valuation corresponding to E prime. Okay, so um, this will play a role a little bit later. Okay, and let me come back to the example of our uh, quadric threefold. So it's just a copy of, of the board which we had seen before. So now I'm additionally interested in understanding the quotient map here. Okay, so what's the quotient map going to be? And it's uh, relatively straightforward to see that the field of invariant functions um, in this case is generated by um, y, sorry, yz over U V, so um, so it, it's immediate to see that this is an invariant function, and indeed it generates the field of invariant functions um, inside the function field of Q. And if you translate this to how the, the quotient map here has to look like, it will be just mapping a point on Q to the point yz uv in p1. Okay, so we understand our um, first example um, in, this, in this new setting. So the, the quadric default here comes with a natural um, two torus action and it comes with a quotient map down to P1. Okay, so we have already seen, or I mentioned already that on P1, every evaluation is actually proportional just to the vanishing order of a point. So again, this should be P1 here. And so, um, recall the lemma we had earlier in the general setting for T varieties. So if M, the, the, the restriction of um, the, the vanishing order of uh, an invariant divisor E, which I denoted by mu to the field of invariant functions is proportional to the vanishing the, the restriction of the vanishing order of the second divisor, which I denote by E prime, then I told you that we have this formula for the Futaki invariance. But, so this was just a lemma a few, few boards earlier. But now we are in the situation that actually every restriction of uh, the vanishing order to the field of invariant functions will be proportional to the vanishing order of some point on P1. And we want to make use of this fact, right? So the, the corollary here is that if we are in the situation that the Futaki character is zero, then if we 
uh, pick any divisor over our variety x, so sitting in some x tilde above of x, then we can actually find a prime divisor on x itself, which I denote by e prime, such that the beta invariant of the first divisor e is actually proportional to the beta invariant of the divisor e prime. So, and the consequence of this is of course, it will be sufficient to check divisors on X instead of all divisors over X, right? So I recall that by proportional, I mean, indeed, so it, it just differs by a positive constant. Okay, um, how to prove this? I mean, um, I have to come up with this divisor E prime, right? So I uh, given a divisor E over my variety X, I have to find a way to come up with the divisor uh, E prime such that I have this situation. Um, so let's try to, to, to do this. Um, so I take the vanishing order of my divisor E, I restrict it to the field of invariant functions. And what I just claimed is actually this restriction necessarily is proportional to the vanishing order of some point on P1. And now, I can take this point and consider the fiber of this point under my quotient map. And um, I can take E prime to be a component of this fiber. I mean, so the, the, my quotient map is a map to a curve. So a fiber is going to be indeed a divisor on my variety X. So ne not necessarily um, um, reduced or reducible, but uh, I can just pick one component of this fiber. Okay, so then by what I've told you before, we, G we see that if I take now the vanishing order of E prime restricted to the field of invariant functions, then this will be also proportional to odd, the vanishing order of this point, y. And in particular, those two restrictions here are proportional to each other, right? So, and this was exactly the sit setting of our lemma, right? So the, the mu's where these restrictions. So we see we are able to apply our lemma and the lemma tells us that um, beta of E minus the Futaki invariant of W. So this was the third, the, the second ingredient to describe um, the vanishing order of E, right? So there were two ingredients, one was mu and the other one was this W, this, uh, which could be seen as a one parameter subgroup. And now I, I had the formula that B of uh, beta of E minus the Futaki invariant at uh, the Futaki character applied to W is proportional to beta of E prime minus the Futaki character of W prime. And our assumption here was that the Futaki character is zero. So I just, uh, I'm be able to, I'm able to uh, get rid of these two um, summons, if you want, and I'm left with the claim of our corollary. Indeed, beta of E is proportional to beta of E prime, right? So this is exactly what we claimed here. Okay. And this uh, uh, proves the main theorem, right? So it just tells us um, if we, are able to make sure that the beta invariant of every divisor on X is positive, then we automatically get that the 
beta invariant of every divisor E over X is positive. Okay. And actually we can do a little bit better. Um, so earlier I claimed we need to uh, test every prime divisor on our variety X, but actually we can further restrict the class of prime divisors to look at. Okay, and in order to see this, we make again use of this the, the fact which I mentioned quite at the beginning of my talk, namely that if we have two divisors now on X, um, such that one is linearly equivalent to the sum of the other one plus some effective divisor, then we have this inequality for the beta invariance. So, and the claim here of the, of the next corollary is that it's sufficient to test the beta invariant for all components. No, so I, I have to run through all non-integral fibers of my quotient map. So this was the, the quotient map down to P1. And of this quotient map, I only have to consider the non-integral fibers. And for each of these non-integral fibers, I just have to pick one component. And this is enough. So if I test that I'm my beta invariant is positive for all of those, then I'm actually done. OK, so. Um, let me sketch the proof here. So we have two things to show. The first uh, thing we have to show is that um, if we have two components of the same fiber, then I actually have only to check one of them. So in other words, the beta uh, invariant of one component is proportional to the beta invariant of the other one. Okay, so uh, let's do this, assume P of E equals, uh, sorry, pi of E equals pi of E prime, right? But then we have seen this was actually um, equivalent to the fact that if I take the vanishing order of E restricted to the field of invariant functions, then this is proportional to doing the same with E prime. And again, applying uh, what we had seen on uh, the, applying this lemma here on the previous slide. In the same way we did it before, we see actually that this implies that the beta invariant of E is proportional to the beta invariant of E prime. Okay, and the second um, claim of this of this corollary is that we don't have to care about integral fibers. Um, so assume now that E is an integral fiber. And I mean, something which I swept under the carpet here is I'm also assuming that there is at least one non-integral fiber, okay? Um, so then actually I can write E or E is going to be linearly equivalent to some non-integral fiber. So let's denote this by, yeah, so non-integral fiber. So this means I can write this non-integral fiber as one component and all the remaining stuff. So which could be if my, if I have more irreducible components, then I take the sum over the, the other irreducible components, but it could also happen that my fiber is non-reduced, right? So it's really not just E prime, but it's uh, two times E prime. In any case, I have an effective divisor left over. And so I'm 
in the situation which I sketched before, um, so, so this guy is now some non-integral fiber, right? So the, the, whole, the whole sum. So if I have a non-integral fiber, then my integral fiber will be linearly equivalent to the non-integral one. And on the non-integral one, it was actually sufficient to test one of the components. Okay, I hope this shows what I wanted to show. And um, let's, the, so the last thing I'm going to do is uh, actually apply this once again to the example of the quadric or maybe the example of the quadric, but twist it a little bit. Okay, so um, let's first see what are the components of, um, of fibers here of my quotient map. So this is just a reminder, how did the quotient map here look like, right? And now we are looking for non-integral components of this map. So what could happen is if you, for example, plug in um, uh, the point one here on the right-hand side. So this means that yz equals uv. So this means actually this part here vanishes. So I'm left with the equation x squared is equal to zero. So this is a non-reduced fiber, which I can write as two times the vanishing of x, right? So, and I'm, so the, the vanishing locus of just x, I'm now calling dx. And similarly, if we are in the situation, uh, I pick the point zero downstairs. So this now means that yz is equal to zero. So this means this uh, fiber is non, uh, is reducible and it decomposes into the vanishing locus of y and the vanishing locus of z, which I denote by dy and dz. And similarly, for the point infinity downstairs, so also this fiber decomposes into two components and all the other fibers are actually integral. You can check this easily. Okay, um, but we already proved that Q is K polystable, so nothing to learn here about this example, but we can do a twist to this example. Namely, we can pick two points and I'm picking those two here. And I blow up these two points. And this gives rise to two, um, two exceptional divisors. And actually, those two turn out to be horizontal. So remember that this meant that there is some uh, one parameter subgroup, so some C star action which acts trivially um, on these exceptional divisors. And actually I can um, pin down this, this one parameter subgroup. So it was denoted by lambda two in my previous, on my previous boards. So this is this guy here. It's easy to check that this is going to vanish on the exceptional devices. Um, okay. So now I'm looking at this variety. So X is now the blow up of Q into in these two points. And this is again, a final variety. And I want to check the K poly stability of this guy. And um, it turns out now the, the quotient map is just the um, composition of the quotient map for Q with the blow up homomorphism. Uh, blow up morphism. And so the irreducible, uh, so, sorry, the non-integral fibers are just the strict transforms of the non-integral um, fibers downstairs. So in particular, we have now to consider the strict transform of dx, right? So this was one component of one of the fibers downstairs. And we have to pick a component uh, in, in the fiber over zero, let's pick dy. And 
we have to pick a component of the um, fiber over uh, infinity. Let's pick du and the strict transform of it. And so I now would have to calculate the beta invariance just of these three devices on my variety and check their positivity. And um, indeed, uh, one could do this, but one can even simplify a little bit more in this case, actually dx tilde can be checked to be linearly equivalent to dy tilde, I think, and uh, to, um, it's also linearly equivalent equivalent to du tilde plus e, if I'm not mistaken. So this means actually it's sufficient to calculate the beta invariant just of, uh, sorry, the beta invariant of dx tilde for this example. And so I didn't put it on, on this board here and I'm not going to do the calculation, but it's uh, actually quite straightforward to check that this is indeed positive. Okay, and I guess this is all I wanted to tell. So thanks for your attention. Thank you. Um, I can see Anne-Sophie, so I guess I'm taking over the hosting. Yeah, I'm here, but- you Oh, you can. are here. Yeah, okay. yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, all right, fine. So are there any questions? Uh, oh, there is a long question uh, from Chen Yang in the chat. Uh, yeah, maybe I'm just trying to... Well, it's not really a question, it's a comment. Oh, actually, there are, uh, maybe I can say that. There are two... Yeah. Uh, there are, actually, uh, is a question. I mean, firstly, it's a comment. Uh, actually, I think the beta criterion is due to Fujita and Lee. Okay. Uh, Lee, yeah. yes. Sorry for... Yeah, I mean, that's fine. The second thing is actually, you know, there is something called a reduced uniform stability, which is uh, uh, stronger than K-poly stability, but conjecturally the same. So I, my feeling is that actually your criterion should be enough to verify the reduced uniform stability instead of K-stability. The advantage is that in the singular case, only the reduced uniform stability is known to imply KE. So if you want to, Claim, you, you, let's say you, you do the calculation for some like a complexity one, singular final variety, and you check your criterion. If you want to conclude it has KE, you actually have to check the 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 reduced uniform, uh, uniform stability instead of K, K poly stability. But I think your criterion just give, gives that, my feelings. Yeah, it's, I, I think you might be true. Yes, thank you, yeah. Okay, uh, any more comments or questions? No, well, let's thank, uh, let's thank Hendrik again. And I want to use the opportunity to also thank all the, particip all the participants and all the speakers, especially who have bared with us uh, in the last week in, in this conference, which was maybe slightly improvised uh, over other years. Uh, so thank you very much to everyone. Yeah, and 